morning. It's a pleasure to be here. Um, I will reiterate some of uh, Gil's thanks to Dale um, and others, Kate, and all of the people who've been here supporting um, Gil and I to come and present to all of you. It's just really a genuine pleasure to be able to share some of this work with you and really be working with uh, some of the people in the field. As you heard that I um, you know, started my career as a middle school teacher and then a high school teacher. I also um, I have to, was a Girl Scout leader. And <laughs> oh, you have some girls, <laughs> yay. <laughs> um, I actually did it while I was teaching at the at-risk high school because I wanted to be with, I wanted, didn't want to lose uh, sort of my lens of what typical development was like. And so, um, and I also am the mom of two adolescent boys, Gray, who is in eighth grade, and Griffin, who is a senior and going to be graduating June 12th. Um, so yeah, that's all. also very exciting. So it's, uh, it's really a pleasure to be here. And I'm hoping in this next little while, I'll be able to give you some information that will not only be sort of stimulate your intellectual thinking and give you some new knowledge, but also some real influential things that will influence your practice and what you do. Um, so. Um, Without, I think my slide should come. Oh, yeah, there we go. So I'm going to be talking about um, a focus on assessing social and emotional learning and development via a population-based measure that looks at the community. And uh, so whereas Gil talked about individual assessment, the uh, middle years development instrument is a community or population-based, kind of like a census um, approach. So I'm going to start with the background and a story, just because I think it's good to start with the story, like Gil did as well. Um, why now and what now? And just give you a very brief view of um, this thing called social and emotional learning. Have you heard that term before? Good. Um, I'm going to talk about so a bit of the recent science, which, well, with the idea of telling you some things that things that you can actually do tomorrow, some what the evidence says, and then about the MDI. So. One of the questions, now some of you were here yesterday, so don't give out the answer. Um, so, and uh, here's a quote, educating the mind without educating the heart is no education at all. Who said it? I, oh, I, I really want someone to answer. No idea? Okay, okay, here's some hints. Long, long time ago, starts with an A. Okay, there you go. <laughs> so this notion of educating the heart as well as the mind has been around for a really long time. You know, since, you know, you know hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of years. But I would argue here that the science, the rigorous science, particularly the neuroscience, is really showing now that this, in fact, is true, that you do, we do learn more uh, or able to retain information when we feel good, when we have positive emotions, when we're feeling competent, it affects how we feel, affects how we learn. And now we really need to think about how to bring this forward. Um, in the next uh, minute, I'm gonna show you a quick clip from an organization I work with in Vancouver called the, um, oh, first of all, has anyone ever been to Vancouver? Okay, oh good, oh, we've got a lot of you, come visit, it's really nice. Um, and, um, and just, uh, I work with a, a center called the Dalai Lama Center for Peace and Education. Um, have you heard of the Dalai Lama? Okay, he's like a lot about empathy and stuff like that. And he, we have an organization there I work with, it's a, it's a secular approach about educating the heart. And they've been really trying to think, like all of you, how do you get this idea of social and emotional learning to lay people, to practitioners, to people who might not know the scientific research. And so they've really tried to been working on something called knowledge translation. And they've now come up with a very short clip that's on their website and that hopefully I'll share with all of you about this notion. But think of some of the key points that are made in this short video. When a child is born, we do everything we can to protect them, nurture them, love them. A child's heart and mind are fragile. As they grow, we want to teach them everything we know. We send them to school to fill their minds with wonderful knowledge, 
to give them the tools they need for life. At school, they get a taste of what things are like in the world outside. There is friendship, romance, disappointment, embarrassment, discrimination, and bullying. But are the tools we give them enough to prepare them for this world? We have an enormous responsibility and an amazing opportunity. If we truly want to prepare them for the world outside, we must also educate the heart. Because to navigate the world outside with compassion, acceptance, and tolerance, we need to teach them compassion, acceptance, and tolerance. This can begin in our schools and it can start today. It can happen at hockey practice, dance class, at day camps and music lessons. And it's already happening around the world with astonishing results. If we want our children to grow into socially and emotionally capable young people, we must ask for a balanced education that puts importance on educating both the mind and the heart. Okay, so what were some of the key points that you got from that video? So it's on the Dalai Lama Center website, and I think I can share, oh, in fact, I should mention that we can share all the slides, that all of you can see the slides, so don't feel like you have to take copious notes in the video. So what were some of the key points that you got from that about educating the heart? What are some things that resonate? Yes. The, the idea of connectedness, that we need to think about how things are all connected together. What other kinds of... It can happen in the school. It can happen in the school, and it can happen out of school. In, in hockey, hockey, do they do hockey here? In... <laughs> <laughs> I thought I'd just ask, you know, us Canadians. Um, other kinds of things that resonated? It's, it's as important that we need to look for a balanced education, one that gives as much focus to educating the mind as well as the heart. So there were some key issues, and I always, always find that part of getting this information out there is communicating to others about the importance. So actually, just one idea is that a lot of people I know, both in schools and after school programs, will bring this to their staff as a beginning for the conversation by showing this short video clip as a way to sort of spark some conversation about what should we do, what are we already doing in this area. So um, here, over here I have three things that I wanted to mention and one came up first. So I just have three take home messages that I really want to emphasize here and really go back to some of the things that Gil was bringing up um, as well as extend it a bit more. First, what is critical for children's development is caring and nurturing environments to create the context. The context is the foundation where all this work can happen. Places where children feel supported, nurtured, loved, cared for, you know, so, where someone there that they can count on, who has their back, who basically believes in them, is so critical, is foundational. Then they also need explicit attention, intentional, and I want to argue this idea of intentional, promoting the social and emotional competencies and development of children, as well as happiness and well-being. And I'll talk a little bit later about happiness. And finally, and I want to really underline this, is that what we need to do is support the well-being of the adults who care for children. I think this is something we often... Uh, there's now recent attention given to this where we really, we give adults just one more thing to do. Now you have to do social and emotional learning and in a month now you're going to have to do something else. And how much children's own social and emotional well-being is dependent on the social and emotional well-being of the adults around them. Um, we know from research there's something called a stress contagion. Do any of you ever feel stress? A bit? Well, guess what? If you're around like they did networks of 15. If you're around other people who are highly stressed, even if you have nothing in your life to be really stressed about, you catch the stress. So this notion, it's the same with children. 
You know, if you think about parents, how busy they are, how much they're running from place to place, and how their stress can trickle down to, to their own children. So I think that I, I actually argue more emphasis needs to be given to really focus on helping the adults. So I'm going to just read you a story. I think um, this is the story I promised. And how many of you have ever heard of a, um, the Roots of Empathy program? Okay, it's a program. Oh, there, the lone person back there. <laughs> sort of Roots of Empathy. Roots of Empathy is a program that began in Canada in 1996. And the premise is about um, a baby as a teacher. So essentially, in the Roots of Empathy program, an infant, two to four months old at the beginning of the year, visits the classroom every month with his or her parent or caregiver to really spark conversations about empathy and caring for others. Um, and you can Google it. It started in 1996 in Toronto. It's now reached over half a million children worldwide. And the program is about using the infant, really, as a springboard for talking about how we feel how we understand others, how we care for others. The children are often engaged in doing activities that care, that, um, of, of caring for the baby. They learn about temperament. They learn about how to keep a baby safe. They learn about making wishes. They do um, wishes for the baby's life at the end. They do a whole wishing tree. Um, they even do things like perspective taking where they have to write a letter to their baby, um, let's say if they're in fifth grade, how to survive fifth grade. And they write a letter about how to survive, all the things you need to know about fifth grade, and then they fold up the letter, put it in an envelope, and give it to the mom to give to the baby when he or she is in fifth grade. So there's all these activities built in, and I'm going to read you a story. There's a book um, about the Roots of Empathy called um, Roots of Empathy, Change the World Child by Child. And Mary Gordon, who developed the program, uh, wrote the book, and she's telling a story. I'm going to just read what she said, telling a story about a boy... Um, the, the program is kindergarten through eighth grade about a boy, Darren, who was in the, in the program class. Okay, you ready? Go ahead. Okay, this is in Mary's words. Darren was the oldest child I ever saw in a Roots of Empathy class. He was in grade eight and had been held back twice. He was two years older than everyone else and already started to grow a beard. I knew his story. His mother had been murdered in front of his eyes when he was four years old, and he had lived in a succession of foster homes ever since. Darren looked menacing because he wanted us to know he was tough. His head was shaved except for a ponytail at the top, and he had a tattoo on the back of his head. The instructor of the Roots of Empathy program was explaining to the class about differences in temperament that day. She invited the young mother who was visiting the class with Evan, her six-month-old baby, to share her thoughts about her baby's temperament. Joining in the discussion, the mother told the class how Evan liked to face outwards when he was in the snuggly and didn't want to cuddle into her and how she would have preferred to have a really more cuddly baby. He kind of wanted to look out at the world and not snuggle in like he used to. As the class ended, the mother asked if anyone wanted to try on the snuggly which was green and trimmed with pink brocade. To everyone's surprise, Darren offered to try it. And as the other students scrambled to get ready for lunch, he strapped it on. Then he asked if he could put Evan in it. The mother was a little apprehensive, but she handed him the baby and he put Evan in facing toward his chest. That wise little baby snuggled right in. And Darren took him into a quiet corner and rocked back and forth with the baby in his arms for several minutes. Finally, he came back to where the mother and the Roots of Empathy instructor were waiting, and he asked, if nobody has ever loved you, do you think you still could be a good father? So stories like that, like this Roots of Empathy, um, really is about making you know, what are the conversations we need to have with children? What are the opportunities we need to have them to be successful, not only in school, but in life? And the idea of being able to voice those, to give a place where you can talk about how we feel and what we're going to do, to me, are foundational for what we should be doing to create those environments for children, they, to, to, to prepare them for the future. 
So why now? And I'm just going to give a, I think um, actually Gil gave a really good background about the context for youth today in terms of um, we know that there's unprecedented rates of stress, poverty, um, there's research on decreased empathy now. We know that children today, a longitudinal study of children from, uh, of young adults, actually college students from the 70s to, to most recently has found declines in empathy, um, increased mental illness. One in five children approximately have an identifiable mental health disorder and pro approximately only 25% to 30% get the services they need. And we also know about cases of, of bullying. What now can we do? Well, we really, and, and Gil, just to, I'm just underlining some of this stuff, that we need to move from an ill-being to well-being. And well-being doesn't just mean absence of ill-being. It means about flourishing and thriving and how we need to think about what are the conditions to promote those positive human characteristics of happiness and joy and really promoting resiliency. And social and emotional learning, I think you've heard of this before. How many of you were at Roger Weisberg's talk when he was here? When was he here, Dale, in the October, in the fall? So some of you have, um, but I'm just, I'm not going to go through this in any detail because you already, probably most of you have heard of the five core competencies for Castle, self-management, self-awareness, social awareness, relationship skills, and responsible decision making. There's a coordinated model. The SEL framework is not just about schools doing it or about community doing it, it's about coordination among school, family, community, working together to promote social and emotional learning and development that leads to academic success, healthy, uh, health, kids who are healthy, good social relationships, and engaged, engaged citizens. Some of the science behind SEL, we know in fact that SEL skills are malleable, meaning that you can promote them, you can change them. It isn't like they're born, you know. I actually find that this is one of the biggest barriers in terms of social and emotional learning. A lot of people believe that these skills, that you either have them or you don't, or the family should focus on them, with, rather than the idea that you ac actually can do explicit, intentional focus to promote these skills. And not the sense that, you know, you write them in a sentence, or we're going to have you, you know, uh, you're going to have to practice empathy just once today and we're done with it. Um, it has to be infused in every aspect. And you think, for example, of going to the gym. Like, don't you wish you could just like exercise once and it's done for? <laughs> no more. But like anything, you need to practice. You need to keep on working at it. You need to maintain and go to other levels. And I think it's an interesting one of thinking about social and emotional fitness. It's actually trying to think about how do we frame that. Social and emotional fitness is about also practicing those skills, getting opportunities, but also looking for opportunities to um, develop those. I'll tell you just one, I have to tell you a, a Griffin story real quick, because um, Griffin, um, my son, who's 17, um, and if you see him, do not tell him I told you this story, okay? All right, so Griffin was three. It's given an example of how you can teach these skills, how, what you can do. Griffin was three and in daycare, and I went to go pick him up, after, at, at the end of daycare, the early childhood educator took me aside and said, Kim, there was an incident today. And I said, what happened? Well, Griffin, it was like over Duplos, you know, like the bigger Legos. Um, he had scratched one of his friend's faces over trying to get the, the Duplo. And I said, well, what is, um, oh, so first of all, I have to say, I, I worried just about myself. So I just said, oh my God, to myself, I study empathy. My child is like unempathic. And then next, anyone who's had toddlers, I, I should be cutting his nails more often, <laughs> right? You know, you have to keep on top of those nails. And I said, oh, should I say something? And they said, oh, she said, oh, no, 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 we've handled it. I said, what did you do? She goes, oh, we actually, after Griffin scratched his friend, his friend was crying, he had a scratch on his face, and Griffin then was upset, and they said to, to, to Griffin, how do you think your friend is feeling right now? And, Griffin would be like sad, and, and they said, well, let's figure out what you can do, what we can do to help your friend feel better. So they talked with the two boys to say, okay, what would, to the little boy who had been scratched, what can we do to help you feel better? And they came together with this idea of that the little boy, if he had a cold washcloth held on his face, he would feel better. So Griffin and the, and the child care provider went over to the sink, ran the washcloth under it to make sure it was cold enough, wrung it out put the two chairs next to each other for the two little boys. Griffin took the washcloth, held it on his friend's face until his friend felt better. And then they went off 
and played together. So think of that opportunity for social and emotional learning. Here is what typically happens. Griffin, bad child, time out. Go, you're bad, you have to learn your lesson. Uh, little boy victim, you get all the Duplos now, right? Instead of using that opportunity, how do we get along? How do we, even if we've done it intentionally or unintentionally, help make um, something we did by mis mistake or whatever, right? Every, it was a restorative approach, a restorative practice. Some, some of you are familiar with res restitution or restorative practices. And it really was that kind of approach. But, and that's really what I mean about this idea that these social and emotional skills are malleable. Well, we know that SEL program, programming can affect um, results, and I'm not going to go through. Um, just to let you know, some of you have heard already about this meta-analysis by Durlach et al. of over 270,000 students that showed that children who were in SEL programs as opposed to those who were not had higher... Um, okay, I'm apparently doing something wrong here. Oh. oh, there we go. Okay, sorry about that. Uh, student gains where they had the social emotional skills, improved attitude, and increased academic achievement by 11 percentile points, as well as reduced risk for failure in conduct problems. We also know, have you heard of the SAFE model? Sequenced, active, focused, explicit, in terms of the meta-analysis of after-school programs. How many of you work in after-school programming? A whole bunch of you um, in the SAFE model. And I wanted to um, just highlight quickly, just as sort of a, um, a go-to thing, um, is that Calgary in, Canada, in Alberta, Canada, has After School Calgary, if you Google it, they have an online free course on social and emotional learning for after school program providers that talks about the SAFE model because they decided, after school Calgary, decided to have all of their after school programs adopt the SAFE principles in every one of their programs. And you can go and find that, those two courses. It's a two part course online for free. We also know SEL is sticky. This isn't just to make you hungry, although it's probably getting close to that time. Um, and where there was a study that followed kids from they were, they were in elementary school and followed them 15 years later and found that those students who had social and emotional learning programs in elementary school at 24 and 27 were more likely than those students who did not have the program to have higher educational attainment, higher economic attainment, fewer mental health problems, and more community involvement and in volunteering. 15 years after the program. So the idea, um, basically, I'm, hope, I'm sort of convincing you, I think. This is important. But also the idea is this is the kind of data when you have to go to others that people are saying, well, why should I take my time doing this, that you need to have these kinds of results. We also know that um, if I asked you this question, what do you wish for your children? To be happy. And in fact, a study of, four, of adults across 48 countries found the number one top wish among adults for children was happiness. And yet we know so little about how to promote happiness. Just that's, that's happiness. <laughs> um, I'm going to tell you briefly about a study we did to look at happiness to see if... Um, so. There's a lot of research, I'm not going to go into all of it, but just to say in the instrument I'm going to be talking about, we did measure happiness and optimism, these positive emotions. And what the research in positive psychology is really telling us in the past decade is that you can promote these positive emotions. Happiness, so first of all, happy and optimistic people live longer, recover better from health, they make more money, have better relationships. There's all sorts of benefits to these positive emotions. And are any, uh, any of you in school right now? or our teachers, some, some of you, just so you know that um, when your t a teacher is grading tests that are objective and they're in a positive mood, they give higher grades. So there's something all good about positive emotions. Actually, you, you do, um, when you have positive emotions, you retain more information, you learn more, you're more creative and open to new ideas when you're in a positive mood. So we did a study with fourth and fifth grade students. How many of you work with kids around that age? 10, 11, 12 year olds? Did a very brief intervention where we wanted to see if we could promote um, happiness and well-being 
by having children do kind acts for others. Because the research is now showing that to be happy, there's kind of three ways to be happy. One is practicing gratitude. Number two is savoring happy experience. But three is helping others. That we can find you can boost happiness just by helping others. So we, ran, we took a group of fourth and fifth graders, about 400 of them across 20 classrooms, assessed their happiness, but we also wanted to know how much they, if doing kind acts would actually increase how much they like each other in their classroom. Because what we find in fourth and fifth grade kids, um, there's in-groups and out-groups, and you start having different kids who um, uh, you know, exclude others. Right around that time, does that happen here? You know, it's kids, you know, you're my friend, you're my best friend. And so we, we went to the group and we assessed, and we had them assess how much they like each other by circling the names of all the kids in their classroom who they like to be in school activities with. Then we, let's see, uh, this side. Then we said to this group, this next four weeks we're going to do a, a study, and for the next four weeks we're going to have you do kind acts. So every Monday of those four weeks, you'd get an envelope from your teacher, you'd open it up, it would say, tomorrow we would like to do you, you to do three acts of kindness for other people. And we'd give some examples, and we'd say, but remember what you do, because on Thursday we're going to ask you what you did. You are asked, you get an envelope on your class, you open it up, it says, tomorrow we'd like you to remember three places you go. But remember where you go, because on Thursday we're going to come and do it. So Monday, Thursday, Monday, Thursday, Monday, Thursday, Monday, Thursday. How much time do you think it took out of class? 15 minutes? Something like that? came back, assessed your happiness, assessed how much you liked kids, and found that you not only became happier and had more positive emotions, that you actually circled more names of the kids in your class who you like. It actually made kids more popular. Sorry, nothing for you. I know. And what we found, here's like some examples of the acts of kindness. You can't see them too well. I'm so sorry. So uh, gave a friend a nice snack, hugged Vanessa. Is there a Vanessa here? No. Um, listened to people who have trouble moving a piano. I gave a snack away without anyone knowing. Holding the door open. And my favorite, cleaning toilets. <laughs> Whereabouts, Grandpa's Library, 20th and Dunbar. That's someone who's very precise. Um, the swings, my friend's apartment, Fraser River, classroom, bus, my house's garden, children's festival. There were just hundreds that kids wrote. And, but what was so amazing about this, and just thinking of all of you who work with children, of how easy it was to boost their well-being by just saying, help others, be kind. And guess what? They weren't given any like extra uh, sort of prize for being kind. Because what we know, actually, from the research is that helping others and being kind actually is in itself its own reward. And when you start rewarding it, you actually decrease the helping behavior. And there are studies now that how extrinsic rewards undermine this behavior. Just something to I'll send you the article if you want. So how do you assess it? And now I'm going to be talking about BC Canada. Right now in British Columbia, Canada, we have across, we're drafting some competencies of social and emotional development, a part of the curriculum for K to 12. Um, this is this new, if you want to go to the website, it's called Curriculum Assessment. We, we, across British Columbia, we have one entire similar curriculum, K to 12, for every subject area, and they're redoing the entire curriculum to be just these competencies that will include, um, and if you go to the website, you can see lesson plans and stuff, a thinking competency that includes critical thinking, creative thinking, and reflective thinking, a social, personal and social competency that includes positive personal and cultural identity, as well as personal awareness and responsibility, and social awareness and responsibility, and then the last one is communication competency. I just, um, I, I do want to say, I'm going to talk about the MDI and how we develop, a little bit about how we develop it, but I wanted to start with, uh, actually, someone who's here, Ann Mastin, who is a professor in the Institute for Child Development, who's been studying one of the pioneers in resiliency research, and Doug Coatsworth, about this idea, it's critical to the future of a society that its children become competent adults and productive citizens. Thus, society and parents have a stake in the development of competence and in understanding the processes that facilitate it and undermine it. And what I would argue, we cannot do this unless we have data. 
unless we have some way to assess it, to understand it. Because we don't know how we're doing. We have no way to know how children are doing. Um, I mean, we might have our intuition, we might have an inkling, but we really need to understand it more specifically and then identify what we could specifically do. Um, and just not to be over dramatic, but the future of the world depends on it, what we do for our children. Okay, so I'm going to talk about the middle years development instrument. I'm first going to talk about one of the, or I'm at University of British Columbia in the Department of Educational and Counseling Psychology and Special Education, but I also work a lot with something, a place that's in the School of Population and Public Health called the Human Early Learning Partnership. And the Human Early Learning Partnership now has a focus on a human development program of research. They have a measure called the EDI in which all kindergarten children in all of British Columbia and now almost all of Canada, um, their kindergarten teachers complete it on five domains of well-being well, and language and communication. So we now have data on about half a million children in terms of the EDI. We then have the MDI, which I'll talk about, which is in fourth grade and again in seventh grade. We then are talking about doing something that's the check that parents complete when they are registering their children for kindergarten to learn about their home experiences. Um, and then we're talking about have, developing a toddler development instrument that, um, that parents fill out at the 18-month checkup. And then we're talking about that YDI, which is going to be the youth development instrument. I don't know if I've even told you about this yet. There's going to be when kids are in 10th grade. So we have a whole trajectory from, from birth and uh, to 15 years of age. And then what we can do in BC and in Canada, we can actually link all of this information to the education information. So we, we do, we collect students' personal ed education numbers, and we're able to link all their education data from t achievement test scores, absenteeism, special needs, and everything. And then also link, because we have this healthcare system in Canada, we could actually also link it all to their health data to really be able to identify the factors that help promote children's well-being from even prenatally. Um, and, and we do, do this data linkage, and I'm not going to be talking about that. But MDI, what is it? What we found was when we started looking at the literature that there was a real focus on sort of early birth and early childhood and then adolescence and that we really didn't know as much about this ages between 6 and 12 and how we really need to focus more on that age group to see how they were doing and what kids were, were doing. And so the MDI is a population-based measure. So think of like a census. So a fourth grade, so if we go to a, a school district, for example, Vancouver School District, of a district of 50,000 students, um, just to give you a bit of the diversity, 130 languages represented among the students in Vancouver. Um, and we go and assess, give this measure to every single one of the fourth graders. They complete it. They complete it during school time. It's 72 questions, takes about a, a course, a class period, 50 minute class period to do. Seventh graders, um, it's all online, and they do it in about 25 minutes. And um, we use passive consent, um, so parents get, you know, so we need parental consent, but they get it sent home, and teachers are the ones who administer it, so we do a whole bunch of information. And just a little bit about how it was developed, we actually developed it in, um, in working with, it started with another study I was doing in 2005, 2006, on out of school time with the United Way of the Lower Mainland. And that sparked this interest in saying we need to know about more about children's lives inside and outside of school. And so the planning committee or the development committee for the MDI actually was co consisted of university researchers, but also community, including teachers, including United Way of the Lower Mainland, other community providers, uh, student union reps, as well as parents. And that's how we all came together. And, uh, and I have to say, um, although it took longer than, you know, than you'd ever, you know, just because we had so many meetings and discussion, it was probably in my career one of the most fulfilling things I've ever done in order to be able to really listen to what were the information that they all felt they needed about kids instead of us sort of thinking, saying. And, and of course, I do have to say we did num a number of pilot studies that have, and we got lots of input from the kids about what they thought we should ask and how, what they thought about the questions. So the focus is four dimensions, development of the whole child, perspectives of children, relationships are seen as central, and multiple contexts. 
We also um, really emphasize this idea of children's voices, a self-report in which they, when we went to them, when we go to them, we say, you are our teachers. They love it. They actually love it. You know, you are going to teach us about your life, about your world, about how you feel and think so we can help you, we can help make a better world for you. And children, you know, they're just so wonderful and they, they sort of sit up to like, you're, oh, we're the teachers, you know, and we say, how are we going to learn about you? And you know, I often go and talk to the kids and say, you know, I'm a professor at the university. We talk about what a professor does and, and at the university. And then I say, I have all these books and I could go and read my books to learn about kids. But what is the best way to learn about how children feel and think? And they'd be like, you have to ask us. <laughs> like, oh, brilliant idea. And then I did have recently one little boy. He was so cute. He was in third grade. I was doing another study. He raised his hand and he said, well, you were a kid once. You could think back to when you were a child. And then I said, well, it was a while ago. And I said, you guys, I have to tell you something. When I was a kid, there were no computers. And there was like an audible gasp. <laughs> it was so, so funny. Anyway, so children, we learn so much from them. Um, also, I want to just mention UN Convention of the Rights of the Child, which is actually says that we should, children have a right to be listened to. The dimensions of the MDI, Basically, we talked about what are the differences. We looked at five decades or more of resiliency research, trying to identify what are the critical components. We talked about, um, I've talked about that already, social and emotional development. And Gil, that's, um, that's part of what you were saying, social and emotional development, we call it on our things. We talk about connectedness to family, to schools, to neighborhood, and to peers, school experiences, physical health and nutrition, as well as constructive use of time after school. We really emphasize this idea that context matters. It isn't just about changing what's in the child, but how we actually work to create the context that can support children's development. So connecting this to adults, you know, uh, this wonderful quote by Yuri Braun from Brunner that every child needs someone in his or life who's absolutely crazy about them. So our asset one is about adults at home, adults at school, adults in the neighborhood. Connecting this to peers. We, looked at, we look at sense of belonging and friendship intimacy. School experiences, and we know how important that school, school connectedness is to a host of other factors of well-being. We also look at victimization, how much their uh, students are victimized or bullied across four dimensions of, of cyber, verbal, physical, and social. So we look at positive school climate and being victimized. Then we also look at nutrition and sleep. Um, you know, if they have breakfast in the morning. We also ask kids if how many days a week they have a meal with another adult in their family during the evening. And this is a whole interesting thing. What do kids do now? Everybody goes to their separate places and works on their computers. Um, we also look at sleep loss. Are, do any of you have sleep loss or deprivation? You know? Um, and kids, we find, have a, a lot. Uh, there was some research I was reading that said kids today have... Um, have um, 20% less sleep than they did a decade ago. So asset four is regular breakfast, meals with adults at home, and good sleep. And finally, um, constructive use of after-school time. And we really, I don't have to emphasize here, but how much important after-school time is. And so then we created these, um, here, these five assets and well-being indicators. I'm just going to go through. And so we have an index of well-being from thriving to medium to low well-being that includes this index. Then we have these five key assets of adult relationships, peer relationships, school experiences, proper nutrition and sleep, and after-school activities. And we created an assets index that looks at these. And um, oh, just to give you my metaphor that we use, we talk about the richness of the soil and how it's actionable. These are a actionable assets that you could do something. So the darker the brown, the deeper that, the more that, um, that asset is present versus if it's really light brown, it's like the desert and not available. We found a real strong connection between the number of assets you have and the well-being. And so um, to date in Vancouver, well in British Columbia, we've had, um, I'll just go through how it's been growing throughout the province, we have data on about um, 25,000 um, students and 23 school districts. We report the data in school. Every school district gets a school and community report. Remember, it's inside and outside of school. So they get a community report along with each individual school that participates gets its own school report, but that's not shared publicly. 
Um, if you want to see all the reports that are available, they're on the Human Early Learning Partner website, and you can actually go and find out more. And actually, I'm not going to show this video. I'm going to just go to the, report, the results and then show you a little video at the end. So um, this is grade four. So here you see among uh, the re reports in uh, Vancouver of the fourth graders, 40% were thriving, 34% were medium to well-being, and 26% were um, uh, more vulnerable. We compared them to other school districts. You could see to see how they could do. So this is the one part that how we present the data. We don't present it at the school level. We do something called GIS mapping, where you actually can look at each neighborhood. So Vancouver has 23 neighborhoods. So you're able to actually look at the 23 neighborhoods here and see, and the size of the circles is how, many, how large the population is there, and the darkness of the blue, and the, I realize you can't see it that well, is about um, how um, the socioeconomic status. So darker blue is higher versus medium versus very light blue. And what's interesting here is you could right away see the circle and see how many kids are thriving versus how many kids are in the low well-being across the neighborhood. And what you see often is not a direct link between socioeconomic status and, um, and uh, the well-being index, where you see here under Kearsdale, which you can't see this one right over here, where there's, it's a high SES area, but a, a larger proportion of kids who aren't thriving versus the West End, which is a very low SES area with a, high, a higher amount of kids thriving. And then what we do is we map by the assets that are present. So you could see right now the four dimensions of um, the assets and see which areas across the city have really high, you know, in certain things, adult relationships or after school time versus um, nutrition and sleep. You do see kind of a divide with larger amounts um, being vulnerable on one side than the other. We also asked kids about after school time, and we found that 73% were participating in after school time. And again, you could map across the city and see right away where are kids, where are they involved in the after school activities. Whereas you see here, there's very few kids who, who it's the larger green that's the number of after school time. And the, um, the other side, this is the sort of east side of Vancouver, more lower income, that has a, number, a larger number of kids who aren't participating in after school programs. We also ask the children what they wish for after school time. So this is, again, a very unique um, opportunity to ask kids not just what they're doing. And what we, what we found was that children crave to be active and competent and connected. So when we asked them, are you already doing activities you wish to be doing, 63% said no. And when we asked them what they wish to be doing, their number one wish was to be physical or outdoor activities versus music and fine arts, friends and playing, computer video games, time with family at home, work-related, and then free time relaxing. So this idea of really asking kids what they wish to be doing, um, and this is just another way of doing it. And I was just going to say, how much time? Five minutes? Okay. So I'm going to go, I want to, I'm going to just, um, it just ha I have some beautiful playing outdoors, music and arts, crafts and cooking. You know, um, one of the things when we ask kids, I did the other, you know, a lot of the kids want to do like crafts and cooking. They want to do, oh, I loved when I see the kids who want to do stamp collecting or woodworking. They really crave to do things, to learn new things. And it aligns with what Gil had made mention of Erickson's theory of industry versus inferiority during middle childhood, how they really wish to do that. When we ask them what are their barriers, um, I love the first one. I have no idea what it means. I am too busy. Um, I don't know if it's their parents, that time urgency people are feeling. I have to go ho straight home after school. Um, I have too much homework to do. Do kids here have homework? Um, and then I'm, I'm not going to go through the... Um, grade seven, just to tell you we learned it, a lot of different things and have the maps in that way. Um, but I wanna, I'm just going to forward, this is all my PowerPoint just to show, this is when we looked at grade seven, how we could link it across time. Um, although this is interesting, we, I said what makes an adult, in pers a, a, an adult important to you? Um, the person teaches me how to do things I don't know. And we looked at both at school and at home. And I won't go through all of these, but how much kids tell us about what they need. 
But I want to, um, we also have tools for action. What do we do? How are people using this information? And that is a critical aspect of what um, we've done in the past few years is really go back and bring this to communities and say, what are you doing with it? So what's happened is, for example, a lot of communities and schools are working together to provide, um, to look at their data and figure out what they can do in combination. We've had, um, so for example, one teacher at a school said, there's hardly any kids at our school who are connected to adults. When we asked how many adults are important to you, 50% um, said not, no one. And so this teacher said, how could this be? So she called up the district and said, is there another school in our area that had a higher rating? And the, t and the teacher and the, the person said, yes, there's a school. And so that teacher took up her professional development day and went and spent a day at that school observing what are they doing to connect with kids, and then went back to her school and shared that information. So this idea of seeing it as a way to really learn and be curious and go back to the kids and learn from them and to dig deeper. Um, and I have lots of other examples, but I wanted to just end by telling you um, one of the challenges that we've encountered in using these data. Um, now remember, it's about the children's voices, it's about asking them how they feel, what they respond, um, and really empowering them. And, but one of the biggest challenges that we've found is that um, a lot of people don't think we should listen to kids. They feel that why would we as adults perceive children's perspectives? Because would children, would they actually tell you the truth? Is it valid? Why should we listen to them? And so um, actually, so this is on the day that I was presenting the first launch of the results. This was the title, School Board Self-Report Survey Produces Pile of Irrelevance. Um, yes, that was it. It's kind of a, a bit of a like, ah! <laughs> but basically, this um, reporter said, basically, why would you ever ask grade fours what they think? Because they're just egocentric, they just care about themselves and what next toy they're going to get, and their emotions don't matter. So, although it was, uh, it, you know, so at first it was like, oh my goodness, I don't believe what he's saying, but it was really an eye-opener to think about what are adults' perceptions of children and how much our own perceptions might interfere. So I want to end with something on a high note for you to be inspired about the capacity of children and the idea of how measuring and understanding where they are can help you create opportunities to promote their social and emotional learning and how um, one person can really make a difference. So this is called the doormat. I think it well, the idea for this next Only in Canada story came from a viewer of The National, a high school teacher, Daryl Butchert, noticed one student doing something he found a bit odd. Well, it turns out that student opened a door to a whole new way of thinking. The school is Clark Road Secondary in London, Ontario. We'll let Joanna Remiliotis introduce you to the student. <laughs> At first, no one knew who he was. We started uh, noticing this young man standing at the door, holding the door for um, 20 minutes at a time, five minutes at a time, day after day. Most people didn't know his name, so they simply gave him one. We call him Doorman. <laughs> the Doorman. The Doorman. We call him the Doorman. Have a good day. Thanks. Bye-bye. It's kind of scary to go to school. I didn't really want to. Every day I walked through the halls, I kind of felt like I was a ghost, kind of. Yeah. School has been hard on Josh Yont. He was bullied every day for years. They just tell me I'm, I'll never be good enough, kind of tore me apart inside. Josh and his family moved to London last year. A new school, a new start. It was when he decided he didn't want to be invisible anymore. Uh. I just feel if I put myself out there and be something to them, too. And so it began. Morning. Good morning. 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 Welcome. On his first day, and every day since. Hey, how are you? And why did you choose opening a door? Um, just, uh, simple, and, uh, just, uh, welcome, and just, uh, effective. Thank People you. appreciate it. Welcome. I kind of surprised everybody at first because, you know, no one's really that nice at high school. High school. <laughs> I thought it was pretty strange. Yeah. But after a while, I knew that he kept on doing it, so I thought it was good.
first it was like, oh, he's coming in the door. But instead of becoming a target again, something remarkable happened. An example, like uh, one person in my hall, like they dropped their binder, and then uh, there's like two more, like two people rushing to help that person pick up all the papers. I find more and more people are willing to do that and go out of their comfort zone to say hi to people that they don't know. Since I've seen him do it, I've started opening doors, like the other said. It's like you want to be more positive towards other people. All right. We're good. How are you? Good. And Josh well, saw the biggest change of all. No problem. Just watch what happens when we catch up with him in the hallway. People just love what I do. Uh, hey, hey, pal. Uh, it's uh, everyday. People always say thank you and hey, uh, people smile. And, yeah, it's really great. And it only gets better. I felt, felt kind of special. On prom night, he was voted student with best personality and prom king and i was like okay and then i get this and i was like oh it's awesome your life has really changed yeah for sure just from opening doors yeah so i'm gonna buy him like pink fuzzy his slippers. mom says she can't believe how much her son has changed he's totally done a 360 he really has you know he's gone from very sad and almost depressed to you know happy and he wants to go to school <laughs> It's kind of stuck in a box before. And now I kind of came out of no so I... and found a new, better place just by daring to be kind. You have a good night. No problem. Rewind of Romeliotis, CBC News, London, Ontario. So, um, just a lovely story about a young man who could change the school, but what is important here about um, the idea of data is, well, number one is how we look at the capacity and competencies of kids and what they're capable of and how we can go to them and learn from them about what they need and what they can do and how we can, as adults, use that information with them to figure out how to create a better world. Thank you.